Thank you. Thank you, Mandy, for that wonderful, wonderful introduction. And to repeat, Ben, welcome to the first in-person AILA annual conference since 2019. This is such an exciting moment that would not have been possible without the help and encouragement of so many people. I want to thank Ben, Grace, Kay, who decided to hide over there, <laughs> and the incredible, incredible ALA staff for their friendship and their mentorship over the years. Thank you to the Board of Governors and the Emeritus I've served with over the past seven years. There are so many of you that I want to thank, and I will. I, I don't even know where to begin right now. I want to thank the tireless volunteer leaders that I've served with on AILA's executive committee. Bill Stock, Anna Luisa Padilla, Anastasia Tinello, Marquetta Lent, Jennifer Manier, Farshad Oji, Kelly Stump, Jeff Joseph, and Alexis Axarad. You may have noticed I skipped one. Then there's Alan Orr. Alan, thank you. thank you for your service. You have been a friend. You've been a mentor. You've been a role model in, for me in this position. You've heard me say this repeatedly as we have visited chapter after chapter. Alan's goal was for us to visit every chapter during his year. Uh, I've said it many times. I will say it again. It has been one of the honors of my professional life to be your deputy. Um, I wanna thank and welcome Jeremy Robbins and the merger of New American Economy into the American Immigration Council. I think that's a plaza. Our partnership with the council is stronger than ever. And with Jeremy and his NAE team, we can make it ev an even greater impact on public opinion, public policy, and case law. And of course, I want to thank first and foremost, my family, I'm gonna keep it together. We'll start with my brother-in-law and literal best man at my wedding, uh, Davis Ligon. Uh, my, yes. my children, uh, Ethan and Sophie, and then there's Cindy. As Mandy said, uh, we started dating a, a bit ago. Uh, we we uh, dated for five years, and we've been married for 25 years. Uh, as a newlywed, I decided to start my own law firm with nothing, nothing. Cindy literally supported us for years until the firm took off and we started a family. Cindy, sorry for the public display of affection, not really our jam, but, but as the 1975 lyric goes, the moment that you took my hand was the best thing that ever happened. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, enough with that. <laughs> I want to spend my time here talking about all of us. You may have heard me say it a few times over the last few months. We are AILA, all of us. It's not the member, it's not the volunteer, the professional staff, the board of governors, or this executive committee. It's all of us. We are greater than the sum of our individual roles. And what we do is pretty cool. I think about movement a lot, evolving, transforming. It's one of the reasons that immigration has always intrigued me because most people would not ever dream of it. More than seven out of 10 Americans live in or close to the place that they grew up. As the New York Times observed in 2015, the typical adult lives only 18 miles from his or her own mother. Over the last few decades, Americans have become less mobile and most adults do not venture far from their hometowns. It takes 
unimaginable courage to leave the security of the known for the unknown. Even when the known is not ideal, it remains familiar and somehow less scary than being alone in an unknown environment. Well, not our clients, not our clients. We envy those with the vision and the guts to immigrate. And we, all of us, have devoted our professional lives to their service. Let's give them a hand. I especially want to lift up our DACA clients, our dreamers. Yesterday was the 10th anniversary of the DHS memo creating deferred action for childhood arrivals. And many of you were there. I'll never forget our community sitting in a large conference room in Nashville, Tennessee, watching history in the making as President Obama announced the DACA program. Over the coming months, we spring into action to educate each other on how to apply and then jump to DACA's defense when it came under attack. Our actions 10 years ago provide a glimpse of what we are about. We are part of this association to better serve our clients, or in my case, to learn how to do this work. That's my ALA origin story. As Mandy mentioned, on May 1st, 20, uh, and on May 1st, 2022, I celebrated the 25th anniversary of being a self-employed attorney in Greensboro, North Carolina. I, as I mentioned, I started this business with no support staff, no money, no history or substantial connections to the big city of Greensboro. I had put myself on every court-appointed list I could while figuring out what my practice would look like. Now, a few months earlier, I had met with an attorney named Phyllis Palmieri in Morganton, North Carolina. I set up this meeting to discuss employment discrimination law on the plaintiff's side. While I was there, I noticed a book on her bookshelf about immigration law, and I asked about it. That was the start. It's the literal start of my immigration career. Phyllis told me she split her practice between employment law and immigration law and literally gave me that book. She also told me she was a member of this group called the American Immigration Lawyers Association, and I would need to join this group if I was going to practice any immigration law. I thought about that moment when I was opening my practice, and I read the book. I looked at the 1990 census at the time and discovered that there were over 40,000 people in my region of North Carolina that identified as Latin or Hispanic. We also had many, many people from Ghana, Haiti, and one of the largest Montagnard uh, communities in America, in Greensboro, North Carolina. And at the time, you could count on one hand the number of immigration attorneys in the region. This was a large, diverse, and most importantly, legally underserved population. I joined AILA on July 28th, 1997, 25 years next month. As a young lawyer with no legal education or practical experience in immigration law, AILA was my law professor. AILA's annual Immigration and Nationality Handbook, which is what was given out at each annual conference, that was the publication I used to gain confidence. I didn't have Greg and Ari's cookbook in 1997. Kurzban's was and is my starting point for legal research. I also met Charlotte attorneys, Cynthia Aziz and Elizabeth Edwards at my first Ayla Carolinas meeting in the summer of 1997. From 1997 to this day, both of them make themselves available for guidance and advice. In early 2004, I got a late in the day phone call from my friend Jerry Chapman, asking me if I was interested in joining Ayla Carolina's leadership. And that's what started me down this leadership path. While I am discussing all things Ayla Carolina's and Robertson, you showed me what an effective and an engaged Ayla leader, leader looks like. 
Lynn Calder, you showed me what attorney self-care really means. David Long and my friend Laura Burden provided a sounding board for complex cases and enduring friendship. And ALA past president Jack Penix has been all of the above. As Alan Orr often says and said just a few minutes ago, be the ALA member you needed when you first joined. Well, I can tell you that this group of superstars were the ALA members that I needed, and I cannot thank them enough. Thank you. The primary gifts I received from ALA were a community and a legal education, and they are gifts I can never fully repay. But I'm trying. I'm making a down payment through volunteer leadership and hopefully can make an impact on this association that has given me so much. Also want to recognize that this would not have been possible at all without the support and patience of my coworkers. My business manager, Tanya Furnish Rowe, has been with me for 21 years. Former Ayla Carolinas chapter chair, Anne-Marie Dooley, has been with me for 14 years, and she is my partner in crime. I couldn't do it without you, Anne-Marie. I also want to also want to recognize the senior staff joining us today, paralegals, Brianna Miller and Norma Perez, who have each been with me for over 11 years. I won the lottery with each one of you. Thank you. All of us enter ALA leadership with priorities. Five years ago, I had three. First, elevating the practice, really, really the art of removal defense by providing more specialized education on crimmigration, administrative procedure and trial advocacy, but more importantly, building a more cohesive removal defense community in the general membership and on the Board of Governors. Over the last five years, we've worked together to do just that. We now have a removal defense section with over 1,800 ALA members signed up. We regularly provide expert analysis and education on complicated subjects from challenging a notice to appear to comparing a state drug schedule with a federal drug schedule. With the addition of remarkable elected directors like my friend Amanda Kevney, the Removal Defense Bar now has a substantial voice on the BOG. Second, a critical component to elevating removal defense is continuing our push for a fundamentally fair and full administrative process. Many removal cases are complex matters of life and death, not to mention this practice often involves detention, past trauma, violence, family separation, and unimaginable hardship. Our clients are entitled to a process which comports with these stakes. Remember, the Executive Office for Immigration Review is not a real court. It is not a real court. It is not, it is an arm of the Department of Justice. Immigration judges are not real judges. They are DOJ employees. And the system to adjudicate a person's future in this country is vulnerable to political manipulation, no matter who is sitting in the White House. From President Obama's rocket dockets and record setting deportations to President Trump's unprecedented effort to transform our immigration court into a deportation machine, eliminating avenues for relief and establishing quotas for immigration judges, to President Biden's dedicated dockets. This is a system where the sitting attorney general can refer any removal case to his or her self for decision and unilaterally reverse the decision reached by the Board of Immigration Appeals. The Trump administration's attorneys general self-referred a whopping 
16 cases in four years, more than any other administration, for new presidential decisions, further stripping our clients of their ability to seek relief. As ALO's Board of Governors resolved in 2018, Congress needs to pass a law establishing an Article I independent immigration court, like bankruptcy or tax court. For years, for years, we thought of this as fantasy, until suddenly there was media attention. And Ayla was instrumental in this effort. Well, true story. Ayla was approached in 2018 by last week tonight with John Oliver to consult on a dysfunctional immigration courts segment. The issue was so legalistic, so in the weeds, so dense, that the segment producer was having trouble translating it into a piece that was informative, but also entertaining and funny. Because of my immigration court experience, uh, George Samaras and Bell Woods from ALUS communication team asked me to work with this producer. I'm here to tell you, ALA, leader, ALA, ALA leadership takes you to often unexpected and often wonderful places. The producer and I had multiple conversations where I essentially launched into Immigration Court 101. Then there were the follow-up calls. True story, one call literally took me out of the movie theater during a date night with Cindy. Whether the segment would even air because of its density remained a mystery. But finally, I got the call. The segment was going to happen live on Easter Sunday, April 1st, 2018. I was literally sitting in the dining room with my family for Easter dinner when the producer called again to go over the script one more time for legal accuracy. She also told me that uh, the show was using internet videos of children being asked some of the questions posed in an immigration court proceeding. Videos posted by ALA members like Helen Terakic and Amy Maldonado that had gone viral. The show aired and its impact was immediate. The YouTube video segment has over 6 million views and generated multiple media requests not to mention it educated the American public about a complicated issue they probably never even thought about before. There were press conferences, including one where ALA teamed up with the Immigration Judges Union and the ABA at the National Press Club, then two congressional hearings. Earlier this year, we finally got a bill. The Real Courts Rule of Law Act of 2022 was introduced in the House and recently was reported out of the House Judiciary Committee. While its passage this election year remains a reach, like everything else, uh, the need to divorce immigration courts from the Department of Justice is now part of the mainstream immigration debate. And I pledge my continuing devotion to this cause until it becomes a reality. So finally, amongst my priorities, I, I focused on a, a, a sharper focus on professionalism and civility. I entered ALA leadership during one of the darkest periods in our history, the election of 2016, followed by a sustained attack on the very notion of legal immigration, followed by a global pandemic. And I'm here to tell you, it's changed us. It's changed us. So many of our society's interactions, from Zoom meetings instead of in-person meetings, from Twitter and other social media, can be, in the words of former Montana Governor Mark Rascott, awkward, thoughtless, poisonous, and mean. Ayla has not been immune to this cultural shift. We have all too often found ourselves assuming the worst in others from a distance. 
That's why ALA past president, Ana Luisa Padilla, created a task force to explore civility. Ana Luisa put together a group of very, very different individuals and tasked us with creating a process that we could all get behind. For the last four years, the Board of Governors has had in place a civility code to foster vigorous debate, but in a way that is consistent with our professionalism. As former Maryland Senator Barbara Mikulski said, after setting up regular private dinners for female senators from bo both political parties, quote, what we want to be number one is a zone of civility where we treat each other with respect. Now, while the process has only been used sparingly, its mere presence has been the gentle reminder that we need when passions run a bit high. I hope this conference represents what hopefully will be the uninterrupted return to in-person meetings. I mean, let's face it, even when people disagree, it is really hard, really, really hard to lift the veil of respect necessary when that person is standing right in front of you. And I am so happy to see all of you in person again. The great thing about this community is that we have debated, fine-tuned, and supported each of these priorities. But as our community grows, it is more important than ever to support and educate each other. For the last several years, our Board of Governors has been trying to put the pieces in place that will make it easier than ever to do just that. We're in the midst of a multi-million dollar investment in updating ALA's technology. It's called ALA Anywhere, and the goal is to make it more accessible and searchable than ever. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> ALA Agora, I won't check it out, the ALA store, it's already gotten a facelift. This year, the tech team is focused on navigation and searchability. The next piece, which I'm super excited about, is community. What if we could make it easier to put out information customized to our 16,000 members and more efficiently receive local information from those members? That's the goal. That's the purpose. Along those lines, we're launching a family section to foster a more interconnected community of family immigration practitioners. Remember, 70% of people who immigrate to the United States do so through a family member. This is incredibly important work. I'm looking forward to seeing what our steering committee does with this new section over the course of the year. And I wanna thank Jim Austin and Carlina Tapia Rano for leading it. Technology upgrades have also transformed the national committee and speaker selection process. As part of the board's strategic and annual plans, ALA has developed a digital talent notebook that has enabled leadership to be far more diverse and inclusive than at any time in our past. As you may know, the incoming president with the president-elect appoints over 700 members to more than 50 committees. I'm happy to report that this year, almost 20% of the members that Farshad and I appointed have never served on a national committee previously. And let's be 100% honest here. We don't personally know most of the people that we have appointed, and that is a good thing. Everyone, everyone has a seat at the table. There remain so many challenges. Coming out of six years of darkness is not easy, and even more difficult with more than two decades of congressional inaction on immigration reform. USCIS and DOS accountability both remain top priorities. Processing times remain ridiculous. 
especially with routine adjudications like work permits, travel authorization, removal of conditional residency and renewal of residency cards. The Biden administration needs to take more aggressive action to address the still ballooning 1.7 million case backlog in immigration court. And they need to hire more qualified immigration judges to ensure balanced, fair hearings. The EB-5 program has finally been reauthorized. But how will it be implemented? We will likely be seeing new regulations, hopefully soon, for DACA, uh, and then other uh, regulations for public charge. Our mission is to confront all of these challenges with advocacy, liaison, and, where necessary, litigation. Now, I am so happy that the current administration has decided to re-engage with this association. Every federal agency we work with appeared at our spring conference in Washington, and they are all back here this week to answer your questions. But I'm sure, in a quiet place, that even these agency leaders might personally agree, sometimes we just need to sue. Our Benefits Litigation Committee, previously called the High Impact Litigation Committee, has been doing incredible work for the past several years under the leadership of ALA past president Ron Clasco and continuing under the leadership of Eleanor Pelta and Marquetta Lent. And I want to thank them for their service to ALA. Whether it's speaking, educational programming, media, liaison, publications, or member services, we need you. Just look at our executive committee. Alan's focus on DEI and member engagement. Farshad and global migration and technology. Kelly and removal defense and paralegal education. Jeff and his amazing federal litigation skills and educational desire for this membership. And Alexis with volunteerism and liaison. We all have different gifts. We all have different interests, but together we make, and I will say this somewhat immodestly, one kick-ass team. <laughs> our pledge, all of us, our pledge is to best position the association to see you. But you've got a job, too. Your job is to step up. Think about it. The Afghan Task Force, the Military Assistance Committee, the Client Resources Committee, the Ethics Compendium, they all started as the brainchild of an ALA volunteer. Citizenship Day originated 15 years ago with a member from ALA's Washington State Chapter serving on the National Pro Bono Committee. A day of service that started in one chapter now happens at dozens of sites all across the country. The CARA project in Dilly, Texas, started hundreds of miles away in Artesia, New Mexico, when volunteers from ALA, Colorado, leapt into action when the Obama administration started to detain women and children coming across the southern border. Their work led ALA to partner on a national volunteer effort that became the starting point for the immigrant Immigration Justice Campaign. As Quest Nutrition co-founder Tom Bayou recently said, quote, the very purpose of life is to find out how many skills you can acquire that have utility and then put that utility to the test in service of something bigger than yourself. And that's exactly what these ALA volunteers did. And it's my challenge to each one of you. Please, instead of what is ALA doing about this? What is ALA doing about that? What are you going to do? What good 
can we do together? We are ALO, all of us. So, again, I want to thank you for the privilege and honor of serving this association. Thank you so much, and I hope each of you have an amazing ALA annual conference. Thank you.